Welcome back to MIC 1350. All right, we're going to continue on with our FANUC instructions here. Uh, we're going to get into motion instructions. Instructions. So this is chapter 10 in our FANUC manual. All right, that we're going to go through. There's going to be a few labs that we're going to be doing with this chapter. Uh, so this one's going to be a little bit more time consuming uh, as we go through and start actually ramping up and getting our programming skills down. All right, so we're going to talk about different motion types here. Uh, what motion instructions are, uh, what position registers are, how to adjust the speed, uh, how the DCS is going to come into play, uh, different types of termination, all right, how we're going to add and delete instructions uh, using predefined positions, uh, position registers, and things like that. So um, we're going to get into this, but if, if we want to break down motion instructions, okay, we're going to break it down into these different parts here. Okay, so as we go through the first part here that's highlighted that's the called the motion type there's three types of motion we can do we can do a joint motion we can do a linear motion and we can do a circular motion all right and we're going to go through different parts of that in our labs uh, we're going to make a circle we're going to do a box and we're going to make sure that it's it's a straight line uh, versus joint joints a joint motion not to be confused with jogging and joint a joint motion means we're getting kind of the quickest way we can to that point. Uh, a linear type of motion means that we are going in a straight line to get to that particular point. And then obviously a circular motion uh, is a circular. All right. Now, we have a couple different things here. We have a position and a position register. Okay, our basic programs that we're going to be doing. You know, when you just sit there and you toggle through, uh, you know, we've made our box program. You were creating just positions. All right, what's the difference between the two? Positions are local to that specific program, whereas a position register is global. If you have a position register, it's still a position, all right, but every single program on the teach pendant can access the position register. If it's just a position, it's local to the specific program that you are in, okay? Position registers are global. Now, we can talk about different speeds here. All right, so if we talk about uh, speed, and this is, there's two different speeds. There's one on the teach pendant that you're going to override the system, and then this is the speed of the actual motion to that point or to that position as you go through. All right, so we can get into 1 to 100%, and then you're going to notice uh, when we do some things like circular, where we're going to go like millimeters per second or degrees per second or things like that, we can actually change uh, what units we're moving in. Uh, there's two types of terminations. We're going to get into these in kind of some detail uh, a little bit later on in the lecture here. We have fine and continuous. All right, well, just for now, what fine means is every position that you record, it stops exactly at that position. It hesitates, I guess. I wouldn't say it always physically uh, you won't see it stop necessarily, but it actually goes and hits that exact position. Where if it's continuous, okay, we can do different arcing methods where we may not even actually touch that position. And you'll see what that means. Again. It'll make a little bit more sense when we get to uh, that part of the lecture and we're talking about moving around obstacles or things like that. So uh, the last piece, all right. We're not going to do a whole lot with this one right now. Uh, we will later on. We'll do some different motion options. Uh, later on, we do some palletizing or we do some offsets uh, where we're adjusting after we've made like a box program and then we want to offset it uh, a certain amount or do certain things like that. So that one's going to be a little bit more of an advanced instruction that we're going to get into a little later on. Okay, as we go through all these. So that's defining all the teach pendant motion instructions that we talk about. All right, and each one. So I talked about a little bit about this. We're going to get in a little more detail, right? When I when we have a joint versus a linear motion. Remember, a joint motion is the fastest way for the robot to get to that point. Okay, that's really what the whole point of it is. It's it's going to get there. Uh, some of you guys experienced that, you know, when you did your your box program or you were doing your to and from. Uh, when you were doing your user frame, right? And sometimes your tool kind of dipped down into the plane there. Same kind of concept there. All right, a linear motion is a straight line, okay, to and from the point. So we can kind of see the difference there of the linear motion versus the, um, the joint motion. Sometimes it's okay, we just want a joint motion, right? We're going back to our perch position. There's no obstacles in the way. We just want to use a joint motion, all right? But if we want to make sure that our box 
is on the same plane, we're going to use a linear motion and it's going to do a straight line uh, to do that. Okay. So when we define the motion types, you're going to move the cursor on the teach pendant over here. All right, and you're going to define, it. right now, every teach pendant we have in here is defaulting to joint. Okay, so you'll have to go over and tell if you want to do circle or linear. And you're going to do different, different programs. We're going to call upon doing uh, senior, um, circular or linear as we go through those. Okay, but we can change it for each move. Okay, so circular motion is the one, probably the toughest one to program. It's not hard, but there's just some procedures that you got to follow, and it's going to take some practice, and it may or may not work for you the first time, and that's okay. But what we want to do with a circular motion is that robot, that center tool point or end of arm tooling, can move in a circular motion. And I've recorded a lab for you guys to watch, or not a lab, but it's me, and I get into depth on circular motion and kind of go walk you through step by step about writing your circle program, what it should look like, and the kind of nuances that you might run into at those specific uh, points. All right, but we program it in what we call an intermediate position. And for us, when you do speed in circular motion, all right, it's going to either be in some form of uh, imperial or metric unit, all right, so inches per minute or millimeters per second or centimeters per minute. Okay, but this is important. You guys will do this in the lab. And I go into a lot more detail, so make sure that you watch the lab one on here. But essentially, you got to go down to your start position. We're going to start in a perch position, so that won't be our first point. This will be like our second or third point. What they have on here is P1. All right, here we're going to record that in joint, and then you're going to move, you know, a quarter of the way around the circle. Record a point. Okay, you're going to record a point, and then you're going to move the cursor over and change it from a J to a C. When that happens, you will get that blank line there. Notice between two and three, there's kind of a blank or a space that resides between those two, that will happen on purpose. So you can't physically put that in. It only happens once you select circular motion. So you're going to move the cursor over uh, to circular motion on that after you've recorded point P2 here. And remember, we jog and joint record in world. Then you're going to move the robot to point 3 that's on the diagram here. And the cursor needs to be sitting below line 2 and you're going to hit shift touch up. It will automatically fill in all right, the speed and how it ends, the termination type of find. All right, you can go over and adjust that speed. So on the program I and the lab I do for you and show you, I use 200 millimeters per second, uh, which is fine. All right, then you go to point 4. All right, you move the robot to point 4, so you're jogging in joint. You go over there, record a point in world. At point four, you move the cursor over, you change it from J to C. It's the new circular point. All right, and then you move the robot to position one. Don't use the old P1. Sometimes it's not going to work. You need to shift and touch up over here uh, so that it works. And I go through that in the lab. All right, make sure the cursor is below line three on your teach pendant, and then you're going to hit shift and touch up once you've moved the robot back to P1. And then you've created your circle. So I want you to step through the program, uh, show me that it works, and, and those sort of things. Okay. So with this, what's the at indicator? And I talk about that in some of the labs. That's where the robot physically is. That's the position it is at when it's at point one or it's at point five. Okay. That indicates where the robot is. Okay. And it's always going to be at your top position where you're at. But then you'll notice when you step through your program, all right, it'll change. And as it's going between points, the at sign will not appear because it's between points. The at sign will literally only be there when it reaches that coordinate of that position. Okay. So you can also change new IDs or we can share same IDs. And I've already taught you that on some of the programs. Uh, when we back the robot out of what we've done back to our perched position. Okay. So this is what we were talking about earlier. We get into position or position register. So please remember position. So position one or point one, however you want to treat this. All right. That is local to your specific program that you're writing. So when you did the box program, you did position one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you know, so on and so forth, however many positions you have. Now, 
when we do a position register it's global and we can write like your perch position as a position register so when you're writing your program you can just call out your position register instead of re-recording the position every single time okay we're also going to record um, you know a home a safe and a maintenance program as a position register so each one of you guys will do that and we'll have a specific position that we're going to store that in okay that'll be one of your labs as well all right so with the cursor we can go over here and we can actually step in and you can edit that position so notice see how it has point one there you can hit enter and you can actually write a comment so that it knows that it's start and you can move the cursor over uh, and change the speed so you can move the cursor on each line here okay now this is what we're going to get into a little bit about the configuration of the robot some of you guys might have to adapt this or change it kind of depends on if you over twisted and did all these funky things as you were making your uh, user frame and tool frame because you weren't quite used to how the robot works so you thought you could just you know do the yaw and rotate it around like 180 degrees all right i tried to work with most of you guys some of you guys might have slipped through the cracks on that one all right but we can change the configuration of how the robot starts all right, and it's going to make more sense once we see some of the slides here and goes through it, okay? But essentially what we're talking about is the main joints, okay, X, Y, Z. We can talk about it being flipped, no flipped, left, right, up, down, front, back. It's about the arm placement, all right, or the wrist placement as we take a look at this. So it's going to make sense on these slides right here. So if we, we look in the upper left-hand corner, that's the no flip on the robot versus the flip on the robot okay where that might come in handy for us uh, is when we have to do end of arm tooling and we put something in like a maintenance position uh, so that if something happens and we're working on the end of arm tooling that the part just doesn't or the tool just doesn't you know fall out and fall on the floor if we de-energize uh, whatever it is if it's being held on with pneumatics or things like that okay so that's what no, no flip and flip means. So I'm going to step back a slide. So that'll be up in the upper right hand corner. So what joints are affected? Joints one, four, and six. So joint one, right? That's the major x axis. And then we got the two wrists uh, that are affected. Okay, so this is up and down. So we can look at the different positions of the robots. Everything we've programmed has been the robot in the up position. Uh, there's not much where we have to put the robot in the down position. It just depends on how we want to reach something. All right, there isn't anything that we're doing that calls upon us to use the robot right now uh, in the down position uh, when you're going with it. Okay, we are in the up position. And it, what's the point of all this? It's it's kind of telling the robot how you want it to get somewhere. All right, when it's in these positions. All right, and then we can look at the difference between the front and the back position. So if we look, right, we're looking at the front of the robot. Notice down at the bottom, we're facing like the servo or things like that. Okay, so we're looking at the back of the robot. But that's where all those come from, all right? So N, F, all right, that's non-flip, flip, up, down is the UD, and then T, back is front and back. Okay, so where does that show up? Okay, it shows in your position detail. And you can go up and edit that in your position detail, all right? So if we just look at this example, right, on this configuration, it's what? Flipped up in front. It's flipped up in front. That's what F-U-T is for on there. Flipped up in front. Okay, so we can take a look here, right? And this is just a slight animation as it goes through, all right? So as we rotate and flip it, okay? Now if we want to go and make it in the up position, that's what it's going to look like. All right, and then we're going to rotate it around so it is in the, we got the front and the back position. Okay, so this is the front, obviously, and then that's the back position. Okay, right there. When we're, This is the back position. All right, this is, this is the front position. Okay, and then this is the back position. Okay. All right, so... Getting back into position registers, all you need to know, and these are test questions, and this is on your certification test, all right? The position is local to the program. So whatever specific program you're writing, that's what position is to. Position register is global. We can use that in every single program that's on the pendant, okay? 
So how do we get to position registers? Okay, so we're gonna be able to change it and you're gonna record some of your own. Okay, so we can access things globally and we're gonna record just like we would record a normal point when we do a position register, okay? So this will be one of your labs. Now, we aren't gonna get into registers yet. So notice how there's an R here. So we're gonna hit data and then most likely it's gonna have registers come up. Don't mess with the registers yet. Okay, the registers we can do different things with and we're, those are global as well and those can affect other programs that we have going on. But we can control speed there, keep track of counts there. It's kind of a storage area for us and think of more of global variables uh, as, as a register type position. All right, so we have to hit the type button down here and we're gonna go down and select position registers. Notice now it's PR. So make sure that you guys are very cautious when you're doing your programming that you're not writing registers, you're writing position registers when you do that. So once you've, I'm going to give you specific position registers for you as an individual. There's three labs that you're gonna have. You're gonna have your home, which is one form or the other. I'll show you the perch position that I'd like it in, okay? You're gonna have like a maintenance position, you're gonna have a safe position, all right? Um, I'm going to assign you guys each specific position registers uh, that are going to apply to you just like I have with your user frame and your tool frame. So they'll be specific to you and only you get to program those specific ones uh, when you go through it. Okay? So when you do that, you're going to go down to it and you can hit, uh, you're going to hit, move the cursor over, hit enter, and you're going to step into it. Now, Notice once you've recorded the position, so you can go and change it and call it home one. I'm stepping back a slide here. And then when you're gonna go in, you can hit shift record and it'll record where you are. Please remember to record in world. All right, so drive the robot to its perch position in joint and then record the point in world. Okay, then when you do that, you can step in and take a look at the position and you can actually look at where the location is on joint one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, now that's recorded right there in, in joint. Now, notice what happens once you record a position. It turns the asterisk into an R. So it tells you that that position has been recorded. So now, when you call upon PR1 in this particular example, it goes to a specific home. Home one might be a perched position. Okay, so it will say R after you've recorded your position register. Okay, and then you're gonna call it out in your program. So what you can do, all right, if you're taking a look at the slide in the upper left-hand corner, you can just record a, a dummy position. So hit shift record, record a position, move the cursor over, and change it to a position register. Okay, but what we're looking at right here on this slide, I just wanted to brief on that. We're going to hit on that again in a second. But on this side, we can go back and forth between Cartesian and joint. Please make sure that you record your position register in world and that you have it set it to uh, Cartesian. Okay, we'll be using uh, Cartesian for us. Okay, so we don't want ours in joint. We want it in Cartesian uh, for the labs that we're going to be doing. All right, and this is what I was talking about before. So in your program, record a dummy point. We have our dummy position, so just hit shift point. And then we're gonna go over and edit. So you're gonna move your cursor over to that one. And then on your screen, once you move the cursor over, it's gonna give you a choice. So you go down to choice, and you're gonna modify it. So it's no longer gonna be a point. You're gonna move the cursor down to position register, or to PR, select PR, and then it's going to ask you what number do you want. Well, you recorded PR1 as your home position, so you would select that. If you, if I told you that your home position was PR50, you would go move the cursor into PR, and you would hit enter and type in 50. Okay, very, very, very important that you stick with your position register. Okay, because you might put your perch in a different point or something along those lines. Okay, so. What we want to define now is speed, okay? Speed, there's a couple different speeds that we got going on here, all right? If we do uh, joint speed, okay, we're talking 1% to 100% of the motor speed, and we're talking you know, seconds and milliseconds and that sort of thing. Linear motion, like we talked about before, 
it's going to be some sort of you can be an imperialistic or metric uh, with that inches per minute centimeters per minute those sort of things okay same with circular motion so there's a couple different speeds on the robot there's the speed that you define as this is the speed moving from position to position inside your program so this speed all right you might tell it to move at hundred percent speed but there's still the outside speed on the teach pendant so if that's set to fifty percent all right you would only get a hundred percent of fifty percent of the max speed of the robot if that makes sense okay the max speed of the robot is 250 millimeters per second okay so what happens is if I uh, not 250 I'm sorry 2500 millimeters per second okay so what happens then if I take 50 percent of that that puts me at 1250 okay then I'm only able to move at hundred percent of 50 percent which is 1250 so I'll only be moving the robot at 1250 millimeters per second instead of the uh, 2,500 millimeters per second. Okay, so that's really kind of where the breakdown is uh, when we do that. All right, and I'll explain that more in class and I'll show you guys more of that on the teach pendant. All right, but the speed inside the program at each position is only how the robot moves to each position. Okay, not the overall speed of the robot that's controlled on the outside on the teach. Okay, so when we're in joint, it's a per percentage. When it's linear, it's usually some sort of velocity distance over time. So this is what I was talking about on the teach pendant. All right, that's the overall operational speed we're going to let the robot run at. If that's set to 100, that means the robot's allowed to run at 100%, okay? 2,500 millimeters per second. And then your program, if you tell inside your program's 100%, that means that robot's going to get to move to um, 2,500 millimeters per second. Now, in this example, all right, if we have the teach pendant set to 100%, that means the robot will move 2,500 millimeters per second. If you changed your program to 50%, your program will operate at 50% of the 100%. So inside your program, even though the robot's allowed to move 2,500 millimeters per second, if your robot, you wrote 50% there, it's only going to move 1,250 millimeters per second inside your program. Okay? And we can really dial down uh, the speed to 0 0.01 and really refine it, right? Because we want to move the robot fast until we get there. Say the robot's setting something in place or connecting two parts or, or putting a bolt in or something like that. It needs to be very fine speed, so we slow down for precision. All right? We don't want to jam it in there. So we can also set things to max speed. We can also use a register for speed as well and call it a register, okay? But we can set max speed uh, right there that the robot will be, and that will help us fit within whatever the DCS requirements are, okay? The last part of this is talking about termination types. So the diagrams on this will help kind of clear that up. But when we're talking about a fine termination type, that means the robot, like I said before, is going to literally go to each one of those positions. Okay, it's not going to stop there, but it's going to go through those exact positions uh, when we do that. If we're talking about continuous, the robot's going to decrease as it approaches that position, but it's not going to literally stop at that position. All right, and we can change how it goes around about uh, to that position. So we can change it. All right, and how do we change the position by moving the, per the cursor over and hitting the choice? All right, so let's take a look at fine termination. All right, there's going to be a little animation here, so kind of follow along with it. All right, we're going to go from point position 1 to position 2 to position 3, or point 1, point 2, point 3, however you kind of want to view it. Okay, and notice we have uh, position 1 is a joint, fine, and then we have linear. We have two linears. All right, so we're going to move in an exact linear motion. And we are physically going to go to each one of those points. So if you take a look as it's running, going through the animation, all right, it's going specifically position to position or point to point as you want to see it. Now, let's talk about continuous. We're going to round about it. This helps us get around of curvature surfaces. So like, you know, if you're painting a bumper or something like that, a Nissan or, you know, the cars aren't nice 
linear lines, they have curves to them. So you have to be able to, when you do the paint, evenly coat that based on you know where the curve is on, on the car, or things like that. So we want to use a continuous type of termination. So we kind of want to round each move. So it's not going to hit point 0.1, point 0.2, point three. It'll hit point 0.1 and terminate at point 0.3, but it's not ever going to hit point 0.2 here. All right? So we're kind of rounding it. So if we take a look and we do continuous, all right, 2,000 millimeters per second, continuous, zero, we're going to hit pretty close to the point, but not hit it. When we do 100, okay, continuous 100, that's not the speed, the continuous 100 increases our arc. Okay? So if we do continuous zero, we're going to really get close to point two. We're not going to hit point two, um, but we're going to slow down and get there. If we hit a continuous 100, we're going to arc around, not even hit point two, uh, but we're going to arc from point one to point three. Okay? And then if we go like, you know, 75%, our arc changes, and we can bump it down to 50%, and we can see, so the, the smaller after continuous we are, the smaller our arc is going to be. And we can go up to 100, okay? So that's really our arc. So what really happens with velocity here, as we get closer to that point, we're going to slow down, okay? So in this case, if we're going 100, all right, on our on our termination piece, all right, our velocity is going to get up there and we're not going to have to slow down as much because we're not getting closer to that point. But as we slow down, all right, if we go 75%, we got to slow down a little bit because we want to get closer to that point. If we go 50%, we're going to slow down even a little bit more as we get closer to that point and then pick our speed up. So if we're at 100, we're not really going to slow down. We're just going to arc through a nice continuous motion, okay? So, you know, what's the point of these? Being able to get around different, uh, you know, obstacles that are in the way, for lack of a better term there, okay? So if we look and we have a wide span here, the first one, all right, there's a slight arc. So you can see how we set up point one, two, and point three to create the arc that we want, okay? If we don't have a big obstacle that we want to get around, we can space the points out, okay? If we have a different obstacle we want to get around, we can use 90s between uh, point one, point two, and point three. All right, and change our arc. Or if there's another spot, all right, and it's more of a sharper arc that we want, all right, we can really bow out point two, all right, to really get a nice tight arc as we're going around there. So how you manipulate points one, two, and three is how you're gonna create your arc and get to the point locations that you want to. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. So even using point one, point two, point three, we can bump down that continuous to 75 or so on and so forth, all right, to really bow that arc out that we want to, okay? So we can take a look at the difference there as it goes through, okay? So let's imagine there's a part there, right? So we need to really, really change what's going on as we do that. And you can see how we do continuous versus fine in each one of these examples. All right, so if we have exam the first example on the far left, okay? Okay, we can make a couple different linear movements and have continuous and fine, okay? Or we can have a joint and a 60% continuous so that we can make that arc. Now, remember, this is very, very important that you don't ding whatever the workspace is that you're working on. So it's something that, you know, you might start with arc zero or something like that and then work your way up on your continuous and get the arc to where you want to, all right? If we want a more evenly coated arc, like in the middle, all right, we might need to use four points to do this. And you can arc between point four and point two. That's where your continuous movement is gonna be, all right? Notice we're even away from that direct line between point two and four when we do that. Okay, but this is just different ways that we can manipulate getting around obstacles in our way we can use the linear movement and we can use a continuous movement uh, so that it creates a nice arc around what we're doing. Okay, if we talk about motion options, okay, I remember when we did offsets or things like that, uh, there'll be a lab that we're gonna do later on where we actually do an offset and we can put that into a position register so we can have a position register set to a specific amount that we wanna offset. And so each time in our program we do, we can do a loop and come around and tell it to offset. So we might move up the Z or we might move the Y direction or we might offset and move the X direction. Okay, important for us in palletizing and doing those sort of things.
Okay, so they're just additional instructions for the robot when it reaches a certain destination. So we might do your box program, and once it does it once, it gets back to home, it's going to raise up, you know, maybe an inch, and then do it again, and then raise up and do it an inch. All right, so we can do those sort of things. But what is a motion instruction generally, right? That's directing the robot to move, okay, in a specific way to a specific location in the work cell using a specified speed. That's what all of that translates into for your one line of code. Okay, I'll repeat this. It's a motion instruction. It directs the robot to move in a specified way to a specific location in the work cell using the specified speed. That's really what a motion instruction does. Okay, so if we just revisit these, right, the motion type, that's how the robot moves to the position. So that was what? Joint, linear, and circular. Okay, positional information, right? We had a position which was local to the program, or we had a position register, all right, that was global that we could call upon. Okay, termination type, how we get to that position, all right? We just covered that as far as whether we're fine or whether we're continuous, how what's happening when we get to that point is the movement. All right, and then speed, how fast we're allowing the robot to travel. Okay, so you know, just review joint motion. Okay, that's for fast, long moves between points. All right, we don't have obstacles in the way, and we just want to get from point A to point B really quickly. All right, linear motion, fastest linear path. Okay, shortest cycle times. So we want to use linear uh, motion, you know, right to speed up on a production line or things like that. And still, you know, be able to move around uh, different obstacles in the way. So when we talk about, you know, termination types now, fine. We used fine to be much more precise and we want to stop with very good precision at specific positions. Continuous, okay. That's when we want to move around obstacles and things like that. So you would choose some a, a continuous type of termination. All right, so everything I've emphasized in all the labs you're doing using your tool frame and your user frame. Okay, so what's the point of the tool frame? That tells the controller where the tool frame is relative to the center of the face plate. Okay, your end of arm tooling. What does the user frame do? Okay, that tells the controller where the user frame is relative to the world frame. It's your frame that you've created and where it is to what the robot knows, okay, in its Cartesian system. All right, positional data, all right, that tells the controller where the tool frame is relative to the user frame. All very important stuff. Now, these instructions you can actually put at the beginning of each one of your programs. So when your program operates, it will use your user tool number and your user frame number as it goes through. So you'll be able to select these, okay? And you have to remember the word constant when we do this. So how do you select those? All right, when you're in your program before you record a point, you can hit the next button, okay? Because on the main screen, you're gonna see what? Point and touch up. Then if you hit next, you're gonna get instructions and edit commands. So if you hit next, you can get instructions, and then it'll pull up the menu. All right, as you go through, you're gonna hit instructions, you're gonna go over to the next flyout menu, and you're gonna see offset frames. You're gonna select offset and frames, and then you're gonna scroll down to user tool number, okay? User tool number, and then you're gonna hit enter, and it's gonna ask you on the, I'm in the bottom right hand uh, slide, part of the slide here. It's going to ask you if it's a register, if it's a constant. Okay, a lot of you guys are going to mess this up and accidentally select register, and then you're trying to pull in some register and it's a random number and it's not working the way you want it. You have to make sure that you select constant. All right, you have to do constant here and then select your frame number. So if your tool frame number, I'm tool frame number two. So if I choose my tool frame and my user frame, I'm going to hit constant and then I'm going to type in the number two uh, for each one of those. Okay. And I'll help you out on the labs, you know, as we go through those, but you're going to do these four labs. All right. So we're going to create position registers for home, repair, and safe. And I'll do a lab that kind of shows you where I want the robot to be for home, repair, and safe. Okay. 
Then you're going to create the motion instruction for box. All right, and then you're going to make a program called box 13. And then you're going to create a shapes program that does a box, a triangle, and a circle. And I've gone in depth. I've, done, I've recorded a lab for you on the GoPro so that you can see how to work the circle correctly and that and you know that's probably the most challenging one out of these is just making sure that your circle works and making sure that when you record your points you're making a nice arc because if you're outside the arc all right your program's gonna you know struggle to execute correctly and you're gonna get some errors okay so a lot of you are gonna be like hey you just got to record re-record some of these points it might take you two or three tries to get your circle right you might get it right on the first program or you know first go around so you know, either or, it's okay. But uh, make sure you're watching the lab videos that I post along with this video so that you can kind of see what the robot should be doing and what it should look like uh, in each position. Uh, once again, you know, email with me the questions or ask me in class, all right, and uh, we should be able to knock these labs out. Uh, these ones are going to take you a little bit more time, okay? So relax and, and do them. And we'll do them kind of one at a time. Everyone's going to create their home repair and safe position. Or we don't want to create their box and then their box 13. All right, and we'll go through there. But all right, guys, I will see you in class.